I'll call, uh, I'm going to call this meeting to order uh, of the executive committee. Uh, I appreciate um, everybody's uh, attention early in the morning, um, even without a, a nice breakfast that Laura would normally supply, supply but uh, I have on good hands from an earlier conversation that he, she's going to be making us all homemade cinnamon rolls uh, when we first get back together. So um, that'll be even more incentive to uh, to kind of break this cycle we're in and, and have an in-person meeting. So uh, let's just jump right into it. Um, I, I don't think we've got anything that'll take a tremendous amount of time, but uh, if, if we get stuck on one item, it'll be good to have, uh, have some time for discussion on that. So first item on the agenda is uh, around committee consent and approval of the agenda. Um, does anybody have any additions or uh, deletions to the agenda? Jim Gilmore. Yeah, Pat, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was hoping if we could have maybe at the end a few minutes to discuss maybe the uh, aftermath of Monday's, not so much the black sea bass uh, outcome, but the, the general issue of uh, the, how we're doing allocations and the possibility of we need a new approach because uh, I think some of us see we're gonna keep going through this broken record over and over again. So just maybe start a discussion on how to how the future we're going to do this great I'll, I'll add that to the end jim uh anybody else have anything else for the agenda with jim's addition of black sea bass um allocation for a quick conversation uh is uh do we have consent um to approve the agenda seeing no hands the agenda is approved um we also have uh in your meeting uh packet uh, the approval of uh, the meeting summary from October. Uh, is there any comments on that meeting summary? Seeing no hands, um, uh, I will um, will approve that by unanimous consent. And item number three is public comment. Is there any member of the public that has something that they would like to uh, discuss with the executive committee? Seeing, seeing no hands, um, we'll move on to item number four, which is an update on the second round of CARES Act assistance uh, with Bob. And uh, before Bob goes, um, on, on one of our last check-in calls, um, I did mention that we had had a conversation in Maine with Kelly Bennett. Um, we've got a... Um, We've got a com. We've got a letter that she has now approved. So once that is finalized, that's the information I said I would forward on to the state. So I'll do that when that is done. So, um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Bob Beal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, um, I don't have a whole lot to update, but Kelly Dennett is on the phone this morning um, and is available to to answer questions. I, I forwarded Kelly. I don't know, six or eight questions that I received from members of the executive committee on sort of CARES Act 2.0 and where things are. <clears throat> a lot of the questions centered around the more than whole question. That one's always complicated and, and interesting. And also uh, some questions regarding sort of how does new money relate to old money and how can we, um, you know, can, if any remaining funds are available, can they be rolled into round two and that sort of thing? Just turn it over to Kelly. I don't know if she has some general uh, introductory okay. remarks on the timing of CARES Act 2.0 and the allocation decisions and those sorts of things. And then um, if Kelly has the questions I sent her, she can maybe just kind of move through those conceptually. And then, um, you know, we can, I, I, I assume she'd be more than willing to answer other questions that we have, if that's okay with you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a good way to proceed. Um, Kelly, you there? Good morning. Yes, I am. Hi, good morning. The floor's yours. Great. Thank you. Uh, good to be with you all this morning. Hope everybody is uh, doing well uh, and hanging in. Uh, so, uh, yes, Bob, uh, I do have the questions that you sent here and I'll go through those, but I figured I'd start with the actual Appropriations Act language uh, and step through that. I'm sure um, most, if not all of you have already read it, um, but just to start from the same baseline. So uh, Congress uh, this time allocated $300 million again 
uh, but they did divide it differently uh, this time around. So they created three different pots of funds. Uh, 255 million will be for marine coastal states. Um, so, so Chris, uh, Pennsylvania is not included in the 255. Um, and uh, the territories are included in that 255. Then we have a pot of 30 million that is for federally recognized tribes. And there's a couple, some specific language around that as well for the tribes in the Great Lakes. But that 30 million is for all tribes. And then there's a 15 million set aside for Great Lakes states. Uh, as with the CARES Act, uh, the eligible sectors are the same. So commercial fishermen, charter fishermen, aquaculture, uh, seafood processors, that is that is the same as it was in round one. A couple other changes that Congress put in place. One, they set a minimum for that marine coastal pot uh, of 1%. So uh, that means that every state that's in that pot will get at least 3 million with a couple exceptions because Congress also set a cap, uh, which is that you can't get more money between CARES round one and this round than your total annual uh, fisheries revenue across all of your sectors. So that only impacts uh, most likely Guam and CNMI. But that is also in the language. I think those are the big parts uh, of the actual provisions uh, that I wanna make, in, make sure and touch on. Um, so we've got the three pots uh, and then I'll step through the questions uh, that you all provided um, and maybe that I think will also touch a little bit on some of the mechanisms. Um, so <clears throat> at this point, uh, as you might anticipate, we are still working through uh, getting this funding allocated and out the door uh, with the new administration. Um, we are fortunate that we do at least have a couple of our appointments here in NOAA. Um, but not all of them. Um, and so we continue to work uh, as with round one, we'll be working as fast as we possibly can to get this funding allocated and out the door. Uh, we are anticipating using uh, the same mechanism in terms of working with the commissions uh, and then respectively with each of you on spend plans uh, for your respective states. So yes, the timeline of 9-30-21 still applies. Uh, now that deadline is for us to get the money out the door. Uh, there is uh, some flexibility for uh, you all in terms of expending funds after that date, um, but we absolutely have to get that money out to the commissions or through whatever other mechanisms we use for the other pots. Uh, so that timeline does apply. Uh, there were a couple questions about the Great Lakes. Um, so we're still working with the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission um, and we'll be meeting with the Great Lakes states here in the next couple of weeks to work specifically through how those Great Lakes are going to be handled for Jim and Chris. Uh, we are open to how you guys would like to handle uh, your Great Lakes portion of the funds. Um, we obviously can use ASMFC since you have that existing mechanism or uh, if the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission uh, decides that they are willing to serve as the conduit for the Great Lakes, we can use that mechanism. So you guys can just let us know what you prefer because um, <clears throat> it doesn't make a, a difference to us which, which way. Um, question around the tribes. Yes, uh, the funds will be allocated uh, directly um, to the tribes or the, the pot of funds is available directly to the tribes. Uh, the act requires uh, us to go through a consultation process with the tribes on how the application and distribution process is going to work. So I can't answer the kind of second part of that question, which is whether it will go through the interstate commissions or the states. Uh, at this point, I don't anticipate that to be the case, uh, but I can't say for sure until we have those consultations with the tribes. But I would highlight that Congress made a specific separate pot for the tribes. Uh, so we do anticipate that it will be different. Um, it will be executed differently than it was in the first round. 
Uh, okay, two other questions that I have here on the list from Bob. Round one and round two. So you're gonna hate me for this. Um, and I swear it's not me. Uh, there's, there are ways that we can combine round one and round two, but from a financial tracking perspective, uh, we will need to have some separation of the pots. Um, so that might make things a, a little bit messy. Um, and if you're scratching your head, like, well, what the heck does that mean, Kelly? So for example, if you had 500K, well, I'm making it up, 500K left from round one, um, and then you're now gonna submit a round two spend plan, um, you could make an amendment to your round one plan to distribute that via direct payments to your fishermen in whatever way you decide, and then do something similar with your round two pot. Um, but we're still working to figure out whether you could actually add that 500K to whatever you get in round two, and then do the math. Hopefully that's clear. Um, so there, there is a way to use both pots together, but we just might not be able to kind of commingle those funds um, because of the budget tracking that we have to be able to do uh, for the fiscal accountability with, uh, with everybody. And I can answer more questions on that uh, if folks have them. Um, last question that I have was around both direct payments and programmatical, programmatical expenditures. So yes, you can make adjustments to that. If, for example, your first spend plan, you had set aside an amount of funds um, specific to a project, um, and now you would like to shift and put those funds into direct payments and use your round two funds to fund a specific project, you can make that change. You would need to submit an addendum to us for the first spend plan and then include that project and the rationale in your spend plan for round two. So that's all the questions that um, I had on the list that you sent me, Bob. Um, and Mr. Chair, I'm happy to answer questions if, if folks have additional ones. Um, uh, as I'm working as quickly as possible to get the allocation out, um, I'm optimistic that will happen soon, uh, but I can't give you a specific time frame on, on when that's gonna happen. Great, thanks, Kelly. Um, just kind of a bigger question uh, before I open it up to the group. Uh, the okay. Congress is currently, and the president currently debating a, a third round um, of stimulus. Is there any talk about holding off to see if additional money will be allocated so we're not dealing with round three? There could be some combination, combining of those two if that happens. Uh, not that I've heard. Most of the... Okay letters that I have received so far have been encouraging us to get the funds out as fast as possible. Yeah, okay. All right, thanks for that. Um, any any questions for Kelly? I've got um, Mel Bell and then Doug, and then Dan McKernan. Thank you. Morning, Kelly, thanks for being here. Uh, just real quick, so we set up our eligibility uh, for the first CARES to, to try to get things out quickly. So we set our eligibility at March through June and looked at losses in the March through June 2020 timeframe. And, and we've dealt with that and um, you know, we still have money left over. So appreciate the guidance on how to deal with the original money. We, that, that's already fits within our plan so we can do that. But for the new money, I, I would assume that since it was just uh, awarded and it was based on what happened in 2020, we would still need to look at uh, potential losses in 2020. And for us, I guess that would be from July forward, since we've already dealt with um, uh, March through June. So it is, am I right in that thinking? In other words, we, we don't want to double, have people sort of double dipping, I guess, uh, because they really can't, because they can't they can't exceed that, um, you know, more than full threshold. And that was part of the problem I think we had with a number of people refusing the money was that they they were afraid of that, you know, that more than whole uh, threshold. Uh, so, but, but what we'd be looking at, I guess, for us would be the period of, of July through 
something to get it out quickly, but you're saying again, we're still under that September 30th. You got to get the money out the door. I mean, could could we still be looking at losses all the way? Well, now if we're going to do 2020, it's already figured out. So anyway, I'm just trying to work out the so we don't overlap and we don't uh, double dip. And it may be kind of an issue for us in that if we've already taken care of everybody with their significant losses from uh, you know, March through June, I'm not sure what else we're going to have left, but am I thinking through that correctly in terms of the period of eligibility and all is really 2020? Hey, Mel. Yeah, great question. Uh, this is one that we have been noodling through uh, as well. Um, so the short answer is you are on the right track. I don't read anything in this bill to constrain you only to 2020. Um, I will double check that with the attorneys. Um, but I believe that you could take the approach that you just described, which is now the loss window is July to November or December or whatever. Um, and that's the window by which people could claim, um, you know, that they had the 35% loss to be eligible. Uh, then, yes, that does present or can present challenges for those uh, who might bump up against the ceiling of being more than whole in 2020. Um, but given that impacts uh, are continuing here into 2021, um, I don't read anything in this language uh, that would preclude a state from saying uh, that February to March is going to be your time frame again, um, but it's going to be for 2021. Um, as long as people hit that 35% threshold, uh, but I, but I will double check that, um, with our, uh, with our attorneys and such, uh, make sure that I'm not, not misreading that. In terms of the deadline, that deadline is on us. So the September 30, 2021 is for us to get the funds to the commissions. Um, I will double check with Dan, our grants, uh, folks. But I'm pretty sure that you as the states have a little bit more leeway um, in going past that September 2021 deadline in terms of the execution of the funds at your state level. Um, but we have to get the money off of our federal books before September 30, 2021. Um, and of course, as we've all seen with various press articles and, and letters that have already been sent to us, there's certainly an expectation from Congress that we're going to be getting this money out to folks sooner rather than later. Um, I think I think that hits on all the questions you are asking, Mel, but let me know if there's anything else. No, that's it. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, I, and I'm just reminded that the more than whole, I guess, has to do with tax years. So there's tax year 2020 and there's tax year 2021, which would be two different right. years for more than whole. Yep. Uh, thanks for that, Mel. Uh, I've got uh, Doug and then Dan. Good morning, Kelly. Uh, to just verify what I heard you say, that the minimum 1% is on the whole amount, $3 million, and not the 255 that could be the lien. And then a second short question regarding the sectors. The percentage divided out amongst the sectors is no longer in play. Is that correct? So on the first point, correct. 1% uh, of the 300 million is how we've read the language. Um, and on your second, say your second question again. Sorry, I was having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm using, anyway, the uh, sector percentages, you know, the charter versus uh, the processes primarily, that percentage uh, for each of the states is no longer in play. Is that correct? Or is it still the way it was broken out in the original period? Uh, that percentage is totally up to you all at the, the state level. We provided that information because you all asked for it. Um, you have no obligation or requirement to use those uh, sector breakouts uh, in terms of how you allocate across the sectors within your state. Um, we're still working through with the administration how we're actually going to allocate the funds. So I can't completely answer your question in terms of whether those would still be relevant or, or not. Okay, that, that's good because in the first round, you know, we chose to flatten everything out, not use the percentages. It almost bit us uh, because of one processor that claimed that was 
planning to claim the entire thing. Uh, in the second round, I think we're going to set a maximum percentage that the processors could get. That's where mm -hmm. make sure we're not bound in somehow. Okay. Nope. Thank you. You'd be, you, you can absolutely do that. Great. Dan McCurney. Uh, good morning, Kelly. Um, when will, uh, or can you predict when your agency will release the award amounts? No. I can't. We're working as fast as we can. I hope that it's very soon, like the next couple of weeks, but I, I don't okay. know. And, and the proportions that you released uh, last summer that revealed uh, each each state's uh, sector contributions, those those values uh, still have some some validity, right? Like we use those as, as sort of a, a rough guide for how we, we, we allocated to four different sectors. Can we assume that those those statistics uh, still have some weight. So, if a methodology is agreed to and used to allocate the funds to the states, yes, those same sector percentages would apply. Okay, but we'll wait to hear from you. Correct. So, so given that you've just uh, told us that the expectation is to get this money out sooner than later, it seems to me that the message you're giving us uh, or that we would we would probably go with is to try to compensate for losses in the second half of 2020. Uh, we already did our first payments based on the losses in the first half of 2020 because otherwise we would have to wait a substantial amount of time in order for the applicants to document their losses. And if that was the case, then we wouldn't be meeting the objective that, as you've described, Congress's wishes for us to get this money out on the streets. I think that's completely up to each state, Dan, because everybody's in different predicaments based on how many people end up applying, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yes, it's certainly perfectly viable for folks to use the latter part of 2020 for those who had their um, their time, their lost time frame in the first half of the year to use the second half of 2020. Uh, I do also think that there is flexibility to have that time frame move into 2021 um, for those who maybe had their loss window as the entire year or March to December of 2020, which okay, might not thanks. be on the East Coast, but other places. All right, All right. thank you. Uh, thanks, Dan. Jason McNamee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I think you answered my, my first question question uh, uh, Kelly and hi Kelly <laughs> um, hey. I, think, I think you've answered the, the first question I had twice already so maybe I'll add another piece to it so it sounded like you guys are still working on that allocation formula looking at the model that you have already but potentially I think there are some differences this time around so maybe um, you'll be adding in some you know, new elements to that. And I, I wondered if one of those elements, if you all have discussed performance on the first round, um, you know, by the state, and maybe that's not possible because um, some states, I, I guess the last I heard, maybe there's still some states that are in process, so maybe that's not something you can do. But I, I was wondering, about that, and then I'll I'll add my second question because it kind of pivots off that. And so we had, um, like Mel uh, said earlier, we had set ours up to be a very succinct period of time, um, right at the beginning of the pandemic. And so the logical thing for us to do would be to start, you know, for us it would be June through the rest of the year. However, I wondered if we would have the ability to treat sectors differently within you know, our new updated spend plan. And the reason I ask that is our commercial fishermen generally got their full claim, but other sectors like aquaculture and uh, seafood processors got pennies on the dollar you know, for their claim. And so we might want them to be able to go back to February but then the rest, you know, party and charter and commercial fishing, maybe starting in July. And I, 
do you think that's getting too complicated or um, is that within the purview of, of the state? Yeah, thanks for those, Jay. Um, so first one, uh, performance in round one, no, that's that's not a, a factor. Um, everybody, all states, uh, we have spend plans from everyone uh, except for one territory um, and everybody is in different parts of executing their funds. Many states have already completely executed their funds. Um, so that's that's not a factor just because everybody uh, kind of did it a little differently, which was absolutely the way we intended for the process to work. Um, so, so that's that's not a factor. Um, in terms of the sector differences or or taking a different approach in round two, absolutely you can do that. Um, that is within the state's purview to make decisions about how you want to allocate the funds that you get and if you want to make adjustments to how you did that. Uh, compared to round one, you can absolutely make those sorts of uh, adjustments. In particular, if you have a sector um, or a large percentage of a sector that uh, has already made itself essentially whole from their losses based on what they got in round one. Thank you, Kelly. Sure. sure. Thanks, Jason. Uh, I've got Chris McNona and Bill Anderson. Uh, yeah, I just uh, had a follow-up question on um, something that Mel mentioned on as far as the uh, more than whole concept and that's I um, let's see for round two and any payments made in 2021 um, I would assume the more more than whole is going to apply that the average the income average is still going to be that 2015 to 2019 for the 2021 tax year when that gets looked at eventually as opposed to 2020 because that's totally different from everything else. Oh, that's a good question that I hadn't thought of yet. Let me get back to you on that. Um, I would think that it actually would slide, but that would make it very challenging. Um, so let me let me get back to you guys on that one. Let me write that one. That one down. Okay, because everybody's income is going to be way yep. different than 2020 in 2020. So. Yes. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, that'll be a tricky one because if it, if we're going to focus solely on 2020 again and it slides, then. Yep, um, no, I get it. Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, Bill Anderson, you had your hand up a minute ago. I see it's down with your question answered. Uh, uh, no, no, uh, Pat, thank you. Um, actually, somebody else put it down. So I thought that was you recognizing that I was there. Um, thanks for thanks for calling on me. And Kelly, thank you for your email yesterday. Hope you had your. Had some good time away from the office last week. Um, I wanted to spend just a, a minute suggesting a, a, a something to consider on the more than whole consideration. Certainly, we understand we don't want people to be able to go down to a Ferrari dealer and <clears throat> buy a new sports car with this with this windfall. But I'm wondering if we might want to consider some type of de minimis status. Um, we're below that number. Um, applicants might be exempt from from that uh, uh, that rule. You know, we're moving into multiple calendar years, multiple fishing seasons, as we've been talking about. <clears throat> for at least for Maryland, many of our folks we don't have a one dominant fishery. Many of our folks are in multiple fisheries, and even uh, with overlapping participants, and even into multiple sectors uh, for qualification. So it creates quite a quite a uh, analysis mess. In our case, and we may be different, <clears throat> we only, no one in Maryland is gonna get more than a four digit payout. There aren't gonna be any windfalls the way we calculated our, our payouts. So I, I'm, I'm wondering may, maybe whether um, Noah would consider um, imposing a threshold, let's say maybe for argument's sake, $10,000, that if a pay, uh, uh, a, an individual's payment is less than 10 grand, that we wouldn't have to go through the the uh, no more than whole, um, you know, it's it's nobody's going to make a make an annual living on this, uh, and it, it as I said the 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 administrative burden of going getting the information and what have you is pretty significant. So that seems to me like a logical thing to consider, just for you to think about. Um, we would appreciate your thoughts. Thank you. 
Great, thanks, Bill. Yes, I did have a, a nice couple of days off. Thank you uh, for asking. It's my oldest niece's fifth birthday, so we had a good, good jam, jam, jam time. Um, so that's a great suggestion. I will take that back. Um, I know that the more than whole part of this has been uh, one of the most challenging, if not the most challenging, uh, parts of implementing this. Uh, so let me take that back uh, and see if uh, we might be able to figure figure something out um, with respect to that along the lines of what you described, Bill. Um, I'm not I'm not completely optimistic uh, about that, just given some of the conversations we had in round one. Um, but I'm certainly uh, ready to to make another go of that. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, whoa, we got a bunch of hands that just came up. I got Joe Semino and John Clark. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you for being here and to you and your staff for just being so responsive to all our inquiries throughout this. Um, I have a question on uh, the, I guess, state by state component of what's coming up. Do you intend it to be um, that kind of Landings track back to home port, revenue tracks back to home port system again. Um, in, in New Jersey, I know we had Alaska, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Maryland all reach out and say, we have people that fish here with your home port as resident. And quite frankly, I think it all worked out fine. I, you know, I'd, actually, Mr. Chair, I'd be interested to hear if other if, if other states had complications with that on the East Coast. Um, but kind of curious if, if that's the plan again, like just from our experience, it, it somehow seemed to work out first round. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, as I mentioned, we're still working with the administration on what approach we're going to take uh, for the allocations and how that might work. Um, I would anticipate uh, that uh, the home porting adjustment will still apply, um, but I can't I can't say for sure yet whether that in fact will be true. Um, and yes, I would say generally uh, it works okay. There have been some states uh, where it's been extremely uh, complicated, um, but uh, I think we've been able to work through all of them at this point. Um, and certainly each state will have the opportunity in this round two to make uh, adjustments depending on how their experience went in, in round one on how they want to handle uh, folks who might be residents in their states, uh, but fish in another state. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Um, I'm going to take a couple more and then, and then go back to Bob Beal. I've got John Clark and Cherie Patterson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Kelly. And thanks for answering all our many questions, Kelly. Uh, I already, Doug already uh, asked you about the the uh, the minimum <coughs> amount. I just want to confirm it. Um, you mentioned something about using uh, funds for other uses other than distributing to uh, to the various sectors. Are there a list of approved? programmatic uh, uses other than distribution, such as like seafood promotion and things like that, because um, just getting another 3 million for uh, Delaware, we may run into a situation where we have more money than we can distribute. Um, and I, I know it's come up about how long the impact period is because of Delaware's uh, deliberateness and getting our spending plan to you, as you know, uh, we already included March 1st through the end of the year in our uh, impact period, and it was accepted. So for other states, just letting them know that that is possible. Yep. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, yes, uh, we, we, so we do not have a written list of approved projects, um, but that's something we could probably pull together, at least give you some general ideas. Um, Again, it's pretty, you have a pretty wide latitude uh, as long as you can tie it to a uh, responsiveness to COVID impacts. Um, so some options that have been approved already in spend plans are uh, mostly along the lines of the seafood marketing 
and or business training, um, other trainings to help fishermen be able to adapt their business to maybe a new approach to their supply chain or how they're um, actually moving their fish. Um, so those kinds of projects uh, can be approved. Uh, well, those have already been approved. Uh, and really the threshold is as long as you can show um, and explain how the project is helping your fishermen uh, or your state address the impacts of COVID. Um, so I'll see if we can get together at least kind of a general list of things that have already been approved, uh, but that's certainly not gonna be an exhaustive list. There's multiple um, options there that I think are available to the states. Thanks, Kelly. And the uh... Administrative costs in the second one are up to 5% this time? No, the cap is still at 2%. Oh, still 2%. Okay, thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Shree Patterson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi, Kelly. Nice talking to you again. Um, my, my question kind of relates back to this more than whole perspective and you going back um, to your team to talk about that. We actually have individuals that aren't accepting our funds um, that would qualify because another branch of CARES Act that went through uh, AG has mm -hmm. actually made them more than whole. So I'm wondering this juxtaposition of between agencies that receive funds and how some have a different criteria than others in and I will just, you know, specify this more than whole scenario. The industry um cannot recover, you know, anything below that thirty five percent from us, but it yet it seems as though other agencies are able to uh, get by that and not have that sort of criteria. It just seems to be a little unfair to kind of focus on this more than whole scenario when there are funds out there that um, that aren't abiding by that. Unless <laughs> um, the individuals we're hearing from aren't correct in their presumptions either and went ahead and received money. Yeah, be nice. yeah, no, so there's there's two two parts there that are kind of getting mixed together. Um, so one is the 35% loss threshold, um, which you know if folks don't like that then they can go and speak to Congress. I didn't set that. That's in the act. It is correct that that same threshold or a similar threshold was not applied. Uh, for many other of the assistance programs, um, so that, but that, that's, that is not, we didn't do that. <laughs> Congress set that threshold, um, and so that, that is what it is for us. Uh, with respect to the more than whole, and, and talked about this with Pat and Bob, um, yeah, it would be super nice to work over there at Department of Ag and USDA, where they don't seem to uh, be bound by the same requirements that we are. Um, unfortunately, those are the requirements that we have to operate under um, in terms of the more than whole requirement. Um, I can't speak to the specifics of why that is. I haven't read the USDA uh, language uh, to understand what sort of constraints or not they were operating under based on the direction that Congress gave them for their respective programs. Um, I can only speak to the requirements that, that we have for ours. Um, and like I mentioned from Bill's suggestion, uh, I'll certainly take that back uh, and see what we might be able to come up with in terms of some sort of de minimis uh, status or something along those lines. Thank you, Kelly. Sure. Uh, thanks, Kelly. Uh, before I turn it over to Bob, um, just a question around the uh, round one and two separation. You don't want it commingled from an account perspective, or or can we can we still if if they're separated from an account perspective, could it still be? I don't even know if it could be a single check. I mean, are we going to have to write two checks now for individuals? Just thinking about the administrative side of this for the commission. Yeah, 
Yeah, so yeah, correct. It is from a, um, a, a financial integrity side of things. And this is a place where we need to devote a, a little bit more energy to sort through. But let me just give you like a hypothetical, right? So let's say you got 500K left from round one and you're getting 3 million in round two. And you know that you have a sector um, that uh, would probably be somewhere around that 500K for their payouts. Um, then you could amend your round one plan to say, okay, this 500K is now going to go to the aquaculture sector for losses from July to December, and that's what we're going to do. And then the round two spend plan covers your commercial, your processor, and your charter for hire in whatever way you want to allocate those funds. Um, that would be an example. Um, okay. And and. So yeah, we, we've got to do a little bit more talking with Laura and others from the other um, commissions to, to figure out those details. But, but that would be how, as I've understood it, right? The non-bean counter, that's how I've understood it, um, it could work. Yeah, okay, that's, that's helpful. Um, um, I'm just gonna call on Bob. I stand your hand, Dan McCurney, your hand went back up. Do you have another yeah, question it, on? It, it did, if I could follow up on Cherie's question. So uh, Kelly, it sounds like you're confirming that um, in in our interpretation or in the applications for these funds, the uh, applicants would have to uh, admit that they, like the aquaculturists, would have to admit that they accepted uh, COVID-related relief that ag had given in the calculation of whole, whereas other payments like the tariff reliefs, and you, you had emailed me earlier, whereas the tariff relief money would not have to be uh, conceded as as uh, in the calculation of, of being made whole. Correct. Okay. Yeah, in Massachusetts, our aquaculturist uh, losses were so deep that even the ten percent payment made on the um, on the uh, two thousand nineteen uh, production by the Department of Agriculture and our our minimal payments, you know, because that sector wasn't very big for us. We, so we didn't give them that big of a share. Uh, the, the, they didn't come close to whole. So we're pretty confident that we're going to be able to give them more money in round two. So I'll, I'll stop there. Great. Uh, Bob, you still there? I'm here. Just um, Go ahead. one comment and one question, um, or maybe a note of caution. So. Five of the East Coast states received less than three million in the first go around. So it, it appears they were all qualified for the, the minimum of what we're saying is three million. But just a word of caution, you know, before before any of those states go out and advertise three million dollars is available, you know, that that number is prior to NOAA overhead and the commission's overhead being taken off. So we had a couple states that advertised the full amount last go around and then they got twenty five or fifty thousand dollars less or something, and, and we've got a lot of grumpy emails and phone calls that, hey, what happened to our money? A bunch of money disappeared, and mostly from from stakeholders rather than the state. Um, so, you know, I don't. The minimum probably won't be exactly three million. It's gonna be a little bit less than that when some of the administrative fees are taken off. So, just a, a word of caution. You know, we at ASMSC haven't figured what. In the, in the first go around, we took one tenth of one percent as overhead, so pretty low rate. Um, and I think the rate that we take at the commission this time may depend on some of the answers that um, this discussion that, that Kelly and Pat were just having about the burden of separating old money and new money and, and do we need to issue you know another round of checks for round one or how exactly does that work? Because we're spending quite a bit of money on postage and buying checks and, and printing and all sorts of things like that. So, you know, just a, a word of caution there. And then the second um or, or my question is to kelly you know as you're considering what what options are available outside of just standard direct payments to fishing interests uh one state had asked if we could if if they could hire or, or put on retainer a cpa for example that all the the fishing interests and businesses in that state could go to and ask these questions about how do i handle more than whole and all these other things is that is that inbound if a state wanted to have one sort of central accountant that they can that all the fishing folks from that state can go to and get these questions answered so they're not sort of a hodgepodge of different 
perspectives on on how taxes and, and more than whole should be handled. Is that acceptable? Thanks, Bob. Um, great point about the admin fees, uh, because you are absolutely correct um, in, uh, about that. Uh, and on the second, uh, that is a really great question and super creative thinking. Um, and I would love that given the number of questions that that we got around those kinds of issues. Um, I'd like to be able to directly just say yes. Uh, that would be my leaning, but let me take that back with the other questions that y'all had um, and, and double check uh, with folks to make sure that that, that would be okay. Um, but but my, my inclination would be yes, um, because that is addressing, you know, the impacts of COVID as it relates to um, how folks are handling their payments um, and in support of their business. Um, but, but let me get back to you. Great, thanks. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so I'm just kind of doing a little time management here. I think we need to move on um, to the to the next agenda item. Kelly, I want to thank you for uh, fielding all of those questions. I am sure we're going to be uh, calling again for uh, another round of this at some point. Um, but if there's anything in the meantime that we can do from a commissioner state's standpoint, don't hesitate to reach out to us as well. Great, thanks so much, Pat. Thanks to all of you for your time this morning. And yes, absolutely, please um, continue to send the emails, send me a, uh, give me a call, whatever. Uh, it's certainly a lot easier to be able to try and tackle you guys' uh, questions. So um, please keep them coming and uh, I hope to be back to everybody uh, very soon. So thanks for having me. Great, thanks, Kelly. Um, let's move on with the, the, to the next. We'll move on to the next agenda item, which is uh, legislative and appropriations updates. Bob, thanks, Pat. I think uh, this agenda item and the next one may kind of smear together a little bit on the the appropriations conversation, and that's that's probably okay. Um, the we don't have much of a legislative update. You know, as we talked about at the last executive can be called. There was there is a, a couple of different versions of Magnus and Stevens Act swirling around with some public comment periods that have at least ended on the Huffman bill. Um, so we'll, you know, continue to monitor those. There are no direct impacts to the Atlantic Coastal Act or any of the other state activities in, in those draft bills that I'm aware of. So, you know, nothing earth shattering there or too worrisome as far as our, our, our you know, the state and the interstate perspective. Um, a couple, you know, timelines of note, uh, you know, the Senate Commerce Committee um, had a, had a uh, review of the potential new Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo, the um, current governor in, in uh, Rhode Island. Uh, there's going to be an executive session today, and the full committee, full Senate Commerce Committee, is going to vote on um, Governor Raimondo's confirmation today. And then the full Senate will need to vote uh, at some other time uh, on that confirmation. So that's Still in the works, it seems to be moving forward, and uh, it didn't sound like there was significant objection um, during the, the first hearing that was held on that. The House Committee um, on Natural Resources is, is kind of still trying to get organized. Um, and they've got an organizational hearing today on what that on how they will be organized, and, and then uh, there's going to be a House Appropriations uh, organizational hearing tomorrow. Uh, so you know all these all these things are being sorted out, and as everyone knows, Senate is kind of split 50-50, and Schumer and McConnell are trying to set the ground rules for for how the Senate's going to operate given the 50-50 uh, provision. This happened I don't know four Congresses ago or something like that, and um, so I think they're going to borrow a, a lot of the guidance from the last time we had a 50-50 split in Congress on on how to interact with each other. Um, so. Stay tuned on that. The ground rules aren't set, and we don't know the leadership um, for a number of the committees uh, moving forward. So I'll have to, you know, keep an eye on those or subcommittees really. Um, the NOAA AA position has obviously not been reappointed, uh, so that position's up in the air. The as far as appropriations go, and this is the part that's probably going to smear into the OMB letter a little bit. Um, you know, Deke and I always work on a, on a list of priorities that we bring forward to Capitol Hill. Um, some of them are, are show up as report language and show, some of them show up as line items in the budget. 
the line items that we always uh, push for, obviously, are at FICMA and the regional councils, uh, interjurisdictional inter fisheries, the JAAs for law enforcement, um, NEMAP and CMAP uh, are buried in the fishery data collection and survey line, um, the fishery information networks, and then generally we, we, we include sort of general language on recreational data and management. Um, you know, the, 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 any way we can improve recreational data, we support that. Um, lowering PSEs through MRIP, or, you know, I think we're at the point where a number of other tools may be uh, at least explored as far as apps and other things to collect, rec you know, self-report recreational data. Uh, so those are the line items. Some of the report language that we've been successful in the past in getting in there is uh, the horseshoe crab trawl survey that's run through Virginia Tech. That's a little over 200,000, and that's been, I think we've been successful since 2016 in getting language in there, and it's included this year, so we want to carry that forward. Uh, the American Lobster and Joan Crab research work through uh, CFRF in Rhode Island, the Commercial Fisheries Research Foundation. Um, basically, they're essentially what amounts to a study fleet uh, collecting biological information from lobster and Jonah crab. We've been successful in getting that language in there. Um, there's a number of right whale provisions that were included in the report language this year for enforcement and um, research, as well as transitioning the lobster fishery under the, the um, take reduction plan that's out there. Mm -hmm. And the, the, what's in the OMB letter, um, you know, essentially mirrors all these. There's a couple uh, the, the other provision or other other research activity that is in the OMB letter is the um, NEMAP and the NEMAP New, uh, Maine, New Hampshire work in particular. Um, so that's important. The um, During the Menhaden board meeting earlier this week, there was a conversation about Chesapeake Bay Menhaden research and should, should that research, um, which is a little bit nebulous right now, but the technical folks are going to work on defining that, should that research be um, added to the OMB letter, or should it just be added to the list of things that Deke and I and others bring up to Capitol Hill when we meet with appropriation staff and individual offices on, on our budget priorities? Uh, so that's that's a point of conversation, I think, that, that can be had now, Pat. Uh, but other than that, you know, that's a quick update on where we are with, with uh, legislation and appropriations. This year's appropriation cycle, obviously, is going to be really funky. Uh, we don't have the president's budget yet, and, and you know, the administration still getting their feet under them. So um, it's, we're going to be very far off cycle, but we'll we'll do the best we can. And, and you know, it, it, I imagine we're going to be doing virtual meetings instead of real meetings, probably the first half of the year at least. So uh, we're going to have to figure out what to do and, and sort of how to interact effectively with the appropriations crowd in the virtual format. So that's all I've got, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks for that, Bob. I, I do know, and I and I do see Steve Bowman's hand up, and I'll come to you in just a second, Steve. But I know Steve has raised on uh, a few executive committee calls now this issue around um, more work that needs to be done in Chesapeake Bay as far as an abundance study for Menhaden. Um, Bill Anderson reached out to Bob and I earlier in the week, and. Um, as we've been thinking about it, even sitting up here in the corner here, we're becoming more and more supportive of that work. I think it's going to be important for an understanding of uh, the overall biomass um, uh, and the conversations that we're going to be having in the future. So I, I'm i kind of starting to actually think that we may want to add that to the OMB um, letter, uh, as well as kind of adding, in, adding it into the conversations that Bob and Deke will have on the Hill, and then uh, and then obviously it'll be up to the states whether they want to bring that forward to their own, own delegation. Um, so that's that's one area I think we need to focus on today, as well as getting um, uh, executive committee members' thoughts on the OMB letter in general. So uh, with that, is there any anybody have any questions or comments, Steve Bowman? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate your comments this morning. Um, the discussion that went on yesterday pertaining to uh, studies for Menhaden, uh, the terminology was used uh, about certain items being on the radar. Um, anybody that's ever looked at a radar knows that it has rings on it, and those rings can go uh, in recreational radar, but vessels up to 64 miles and 
I've never been on a military ship, so I imagine it can go further. So, um, you know, if it's on the radar and it's at the 64 mile ring and it stays out there and the vessel's not moving very fast, we'll never get to it. Um, so as far as, uh, to that point, we, we've been talking about the need for Menhaden studies um, for the last couple of years. And I, I really want to take this opportunity to thank you for, uh, for your comments as it relates to that. But we need to push this, this, this forward and, and get it done. Um, we're talking about allocation, reallocation. I mean, Menhaden comes up all the time uh, in reference to what we do. And I believe it, it, it's one of those species that at this juncture um, really deserves some attention, some money put toward it. I'd even thought of the concept, you know, if we don't have enough money, when we were just talking about virtual meetings, I'm sure these virtual meetings that we've gotten pretty good at are saving us a significant amount of money. If we were to dedicate uh, two meetings a year to be virtually and use those savings and apply them toward other fishery needs, such as a Menhaden study, I think that's a that's a concept that might be want to be we might want to consider as well. So, at the end of the day, sir, I really want to take this opportunity to thank you for bringing that that matter to uh, to the group, and I really really hope that we move forward on this matter. I have but eleven months left in my term. Um, and I would really like to see something move uh, in that direction prior to my departure if it's the last thing that we do. So thank you very much for bringing it up, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, Bill Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. I just want to kind of pile on a little bit uh, to what Steve said. I, I have to agree. And um, I just wanted to remind the group that, I don't know, was it a year ago, two years ago? I can't remember anymore. Uh, Dr. Wilberg at UMSEAS um, responded to a request for uh, kind of scoping um, an approach to do a study, a, a hybrid, I guess it was aerial systems and, and uh, uh, side scan sonar and other water-based systems, uh, which I think give you a much better 3D look at, at what's going on. Um, I think that's out there for us to use as a starting point to decide what this thing ought to look like now. I know it's a big pile of cash to do this, um, no question about it. Um, obviously, it's, it's going to benefit us in the Chesapeake Bay, but I think the, the technology, the lessons learned and stuff could be, you know, deployed along the East Coast. And I think it would also be valuable for other species, too. So I think there's there's more to this than just what it will do for Menhaden research, which is critical. Um, but there's some other benefits from this as well in terms of, of looking at this new approach for, for uh uh, deploying different kinds of technology. So that's all I wanted to um, mention. And, and Steve, I, uh, I'm, I'm with you on this one. Uh, thanks for that comment, Bill. Uh, Joseph Mino. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, you know, I, I've always been interested in this aerial survey, you know, spent, um, quite a few years in the Chesapeake. And I, I, I'm supportive of Menhaden funding. Um, one of the things that really sticks in my mind is how static our information is on the contribution of other areas to the Menhaden population. So I, I would kind of hope that if we're talking Menhaden funding, that we also have the ability to do other stuff like try and get some idea of what percentage of the stock is coming from different areas and not just assume that it stays the same as what we found out many years ago because conditions are changing. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Thanks, Joe. Um, anybody else on uh, on this topic? Phil Zaylor, um, we'll call on you, Phil. Phil, you just have to unmute yourself. I'm sorry. Uh, I got an email from uh, Michael Wilberg on the 17th, and he said basically the uh, with regard to the Chesapeake Bay uh, survey of how what the biomass is of Atlantic Menhaden, he said the options range between 240,000 and 755,000 dollars, and he said uh, he thinks he could do a reasonable job for about 250 to 350 k. 
I guess the only the only uh, dialogue I had uh, prior to that about uh, you know you're going to get one shot this Mike you know so like uh, I don't see the money coming you know two and th every two and three years to figure out what the biomass is so um, that's just something I think that the executive committee needs to take into consideration. I mean, based on uh, what I've seen so far and based on the allocations, I mean, we're taking 26 and a half percent out of the Virginia portion of the Chesapeake Bay relative to the total allowable catch. Uh, so what this, what the board did, the Atlantic Menhaden board decided last August was, hey, we don't have enough Atlantic Menhaden to satisfy the ecological reference points study. Uh, results. So let's cut everything 10%. All right, so if you're going to cut it 10% for the entire Atlantic coast and you're still taking 26 and a half percent. Phil, Phil, Phil I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in. The focus is right now on um, the issues around funding um, for any studies. So um, you, you've, you've made a comment about the cost. Do you have anything else you'd like to add to that? That's fine. I'll, I'll stop. Have a good day. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Uh, Spud Woodard. Spud, you're on mute. Well, right now, can you hear me? Uh, All right. Loud, loud and clear. Sorry about that. Okay. I was looking at the draft letter, and you know, we're not going to have the sort of detailed information that we have about cost uh, for some of the. Uh, other type of activities that we've highlighted uh, down under number four. But I think maybe at the least we can put in uh, where we say fisheries data collection surveys and assessments. And we've got you know, knee map, sea map, things like that. We could at least put in there, you know, uh, some sort of bullet that addresses Menhaden research uh, uh, just to get it, um, as Steve said, a little closer into the center of the radar uh, and then you know hopefully as we get more input from the TC and the ERP work group we can pinpoint uh, some cost and come up with some, some further detail and Mel had texted me and I, I do think that the time is right uh, the current administration is going to have a focus on climate change and obviously uh, the dynamics of the Menhaden population are affected by climate change and what way we don't know exactly but we know that the, the fish are showing up in different places and uh, there's some cyclical elements of this as Lynn described yesterday, but uh, at least we can go forward. Now, one one word of caution, I know that we are concerned about the cost of these aerial surveys. I think the other concern too is that, uh, you know, do they have to be done on an annual basis and for how long to produce information that is truly useful for, for evaluating the efficacy of our, our management? We've got these other long-term trawl surveys that we've supported, and uh, you know, can we spend? You know, is a is a one-year survey going to help us, or do we have to commit to five, ten years? So, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Bud. Um, I, I think your point about the letter is is a very good one. And we're not going to have that detail. As I was looking at the letter last night, I was thinking that if we had interest by the executive committee to add this, we could. Um, I, I was thinking we address it as quote unquote an emerging issue as it relates to climate um, and, and kind of that talk and your point about uh, trial survey data. I mean, if you look at Maine New Hampshire trial survey, it's uh, you know it's it's spring and fall, but it's you know 400k a year. I mean, it's these things aren't are not inexpensive. So um, if we're going to be serious about this and the information can feed into the assessment work that we're doing. I think we can justify. I think we can justify the cost. So, um, any any other thoughts? Does anybody have any concerns uh, or objections to adding a line to the OMB letter regarding Menhaden? Hearing none. I think what we can do is we can make a modification to that, um, uh, Bob, and then send it around possibly for one more quick look. Uh, and then we could get it out the door. Does that sound good? Yeah, it works on our end. We can do that really quickly. Okay. 
All right, why don't, why don't we do that? Um, and, and is there any other discussion beyond Menhaden uh, regarding uh, appropriations or any other legislative issues that any member of the executive committee wants to bring up? Seeing no hands, we'll move on to item number seven, which is discuss the legislative committee membership. And if you saw my um, chair's memo, um, it came out a week or so ago, um, you'll notice that, you probably noticed that I um, left that legislative committee blank. Last year, uh, at this time, we, uh, as an executive committee, came together, talked about the importance of that committee and wanted to um, rejuvenate, or rejuvenate, if you will, the, the committee and the energy around it. And, and I think we've done that. Um, I've talked to several people on the committee who, um, are seeing some pluses and minuses, but Bob and I had some conversations in particular about some of these larger Hill issues that are gonna be ongoing and um, the need for really strong uh, Hill support. Everybody that's on the committee now certainly brings something to the table, whether they've worked on the Hill or not. Um, we've got a couple people that have worked on the Hill. I know we've got a couple states that have lobbyists on the Hill so my intent here today is to just have a conversation about this before we kind of put a final um, list of names together. One of, one of my thoughts was, do we want to make a change to make it a little bit more nimble so it's easier to, to call uh, meetings? Anything that comes out of that committee is going to come to the executive committee. For, for future discussions, just like uh, just like letters, the OMB letter and other letters have, have come to us. So there's plenty of ways to have input into the process, but um, I just wanted to judge the temperature of the executive committee of where we currently are and if we wanna make changes. Um, Bob, do you wanna add anything to that? No, not, not, not much to add, Pat, you know, other than, as you said, there's a couple states that have you know, lobbyists that are, I think, housed in D.C., you know, Brian McManus from Florida is a great example. I don't think Jim Estes or Erica Burgess is on, so we can pick on Florida this morning. Um, you know, so, you know, maybe Brian from Florida, who's, you know, very dialed into Capitol Hill and was was very involved in, in the disaster relief bill that was uh, swirling around for a while. Uh, so folks like, like Brian, I think would be great additions to that committee if they're willing to serve. Yeah, and there's no doubt we're going to have an even more intense focus with the new administration on what's going to be happening on the Hill. So um, I'd open it up for discussions. Does anybody have any thoughts or comments on that? Ooh, we're going to be quiet. Um, Alan, can I put you on the spot on how you think things are working, how we may be able to improve? Do you have any thoughts on it? Uh, thank you. I was scrambling to get to get off mute. Um, I think these are all good ideas. Um, I think that it's, um, I think having some people that are in D.C. that are on it would be great. I think a lot of us try to stay up to date with what is going on on the Hill, but having people who, you know, better track committees and things like that, I think would, I think would be a great addition to the committee. So I'm, I'm strongly supportive. Okay. Um... Anybody else on this issue? I don't see any other hands going up. Any other thoughts? Is there any objections to Bob and Spud and I um, fleshing out um, some new names and, and a new makeup of the committee uh, to give it a little bit more Hill experience? Um, and then, then I can send out uh, a list of new names um, either later this month or next month. Seeing no objections, okay, um, we will move on then to um, uh, item number eight, which is future annual meeting updates. Laura. Thank you very much, Pat. Um, the 80th annual meeting of the commission will be held October 17th through 22nd at the Ocean Place Hotel in Long Branch, New Jersey. And then in 2022, we'll be in North Carolina, 2023, Maryland, and 2024, Delaware. Um, Joe, do you want to say anything about the 2021 annual meeting? Th thanks, Anna. I mean, 
it, it's kind of exciting that we got the big 8-0. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Other than that, no, not really. I mean, we're, you know, we're, we are absolutely ahead as if, if, uh, you know, that we're going to get there this year. Uh, we're working with our ethics office right now to make sure we've got everything cleaned up and ready to go for, for this, uh, for this reset, so to speak. Thank you. And that concludes my report, Mr. Chair. Uh, great. Thanks, Laura. Um, I know Bob, Bob and Spud and I, in preparation for this um, uh, week's meeting, did talk about kind of next steps when we need to start thinking about making decisions on coming back face to face. Obviously, too early to make those calls now. Um, I do understand that Joe is guaranteed that there'll be no COVID in New Jersey by the time the annual meeting hits. I'm not sure how you promised that, Joe, but I appreciated it. Um, so we'll we'll continue to have to have these conversations. I think we can add them to our biweekly calls uh, going forward. Um, obviously, we're going to have to use best available science and health updates, and then deal with every state's policy on travel, um, and to see if these things can all line up. But uh, it's going to be that's going to be a little bit of work to uh, make a final determination on on future meetings as well. So. Um, Anything, uh, Bob Beal, I see your hand up. Sorry, yeah, Pat, since we're running a little bit ahead of time, you know, one of the other things that you and Pat, I mean, you and Spud and I talked about a little bit was, you know, post COVID, whatever that looks like, you know, two years down the road or whenever we're back to the new normal. You know, what what does the commission meeting week structure look like? Do we, do we go back to four in-person meetings, assuming, you know, everyone's, happy and healthy and able to travel, or do we, you know, keep one, maybe two meetings a year virtual to save a lot of money on travel? Um, you know, there are absolutely benefits to all being in the same room in the same hotel uh, for meetings, but do we need to do that four times a year is a, I think a reasonable discussion to have down the road. Um, you know, I know this week, uh, I think I would have, had a, would have had a really long Sunday this week trying to figure out what do we do with the snowstorm that's going up the east coast? It's snowing here in DC. The airports are were probably shut down for a little bit. And you know, how do we get everybody into town and all these other things that that seem to happen a little bit during the winter meeting? So, um, you know, there there are some pros and cons. Obviously, uh, saving money is a, a pro, and and you know, not having to worry about weather is a pro. But not being in the same room and not being able to have all the sidebars and create the relationships that make the commission work, frankly. Um, are, you know, those are the, the big cons for not meeting face-to-face -face, um, for all of our quarterly meetings. So probably worth a conversation, not here today, obviously, um, but, you, you know, down the road, I think we're all going to have to wrestle with that. At, you know, I don't know what the right answer is, but, uh, you know, flexibility in the future. And, and we're also going to have to try to figure out how do we, how do, we, you know, the public has gotten very used to access to our meetings and ability to make public comments and those sorts of things during this virtual format and is that something that we continue moving forward or do we go back to the old format where you have to be in the room if you want to provide a comment to to the management boards and, and policy boards and others so those are all you know pretty big structural decisions that we're going to have to make we there's not much reason to wrestle them to the ground today because we don't even know if we can meet in may face to face to be honest and i kind of doubt it um but you know, long term, I think that's that's a important conversation for commission leadership and, and this executive committee to tackle. Yeah, thanks, Bob. I think it, it, I think you're right. The more I chew on it, it it's certainly going to take some time and thought uh, and some critical thinking to figure out how we're going to maintain uh, the organization to ensure we've got really good input, both from not only the managers but the public. Um, Tom Foley, I'm not. I don't want to go into detail on this issue at this point, but do you have a quick comment on it? Yeah, I was just thinking of the two meetings we have the most problems with is the winter meeting because of weather, and actually the August meeting because of weather because of the hurricane season, and also the tendency to, uh, for thunderstorms to be up and down the East Coast, that basically affect our travel by planes and trains and automobiles. So, I, if I, you're going to look at the two meetings that I would look at is either the winter meeting or the August meeting or a combination of both. But that's just from 30 years or 30 something years ago into meetings, I see those months as really being a problem. 
Yeah, thanks, Tom. As somebody who deals with <laughs> deals with that problem probably more often than most, um, uh, I, it's hard to, for me to disagree with you uh, on those two meeting months. Um, okay, any any other quick comments on this item before we uh, shift to some new items? Seeing no hands, um, uh, we've got uh, one additional new item, uh, black sea bass that uh, Jim Gilmore wanted to bring up. So Jim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and actually, I don't want to talk so much about black sea bass, but maybe the, the bigger issue that I think is coming at us. Um, so just a, a little background just uh, on the black sea bass. So um, we go back to December and uh, sarcastically, I, we got a gift from the Mid Atlantic Council where they inserted themselves into state by state allocations, which uh, I think uh, most of the leadership was really unhappy with because we haven't figured out how to do allocations just among the states and from the commission. And now we've got the uh, the council involved with it. Um, and Monday, I think, um, demonstrated you know how broken this whole thing is and how how worse it got. Um, including the fact that now we have states that have a significant fishery that didn't even have a, a say in part of what happened on Monday. So it's uh, a problem. And uh, I think from my perspective, we just simply need a new a new approach because we're, we are stuck. Um, we've been dealing with this for a while. Um, and unfortunately, and I understand it, that you know we're all protecting what we have, but that's really more and more overshadowing the science and the data. And again, I understand it because uh, it's easy to say when you're on the receiving end of trying to get something as opposed to the giving end. But um, Monday was quite painful for a lot of states. Um, and uh, I, I think people walked out of the room kind of just exhausted. And um, I just see us repeating this over and over again as we see more and more stock shifting one way to the other. I, I, I kind of thought about this, Pat, I said like, wow, if we had allocated lobster many years ago and I had 20% of the allocation for lobster and it's all up in the Gulf of Maine, but I wasn't willing to give it to you right now, I think, you know, you maybe understand it a little better. Um, so the status that we're at right now is, well, if we don't come up with a better solution, we're just gonna keep having these meetings and they're just gonna get uglier and uglier. And the, um, and, and again, let me preface this. I, this is just a fact. I'm not trying to intimidate or threaten or anything, but this Friday, I have to brief my commissioner who's gonna brief our governor. And I will recommend that we still try to have the uh, commission figure this out. But uh, if you, any of you know or seen about my governor, he's very litigious, so I'm not sure what's gonna happen. And I will recommend against that, but I don't know much say I'll have. And then next week I'll be briefing Schumer staff who's been very, focusing in on a lot of this issue. So, uh, and there's all things with the Huffman bill and different things going on with legislative fixes. So my longstanding fear, which I've said many times before, is that if we can't figure out how to fix it, then we're gonna have legislators and courts um, managing our fisheries. And I think a lot of us realize that that is extremely unpredictable. Um, the um, Jason McNamee's thing with the DARA concept is just brilliant. I think it's really that model, maybe not the specifics of it, but that's where we need to go uh, for all these climate change species that are shifting in their populations. But it failed Monday. It just, we got close, but we couldn't even get to that. And then the holding on to the past failed. So we came up with a hybrid, which I don't think made anybody happy. So I don't have a solution right now, but um, because we're stuck with that, I've got, I can't give up my 15 or, I can't give up 2% of my 20% because the, uh, my fishermen will kill me. So um, at this point, I just wanted to get into a discussion about it. I mean, we can do our standard, let's get a subcommittee or a work group to work on this, but until we get past that, um, that issue about protecting what we've had from the past and using that old data. If we can't get past that, then the only solution is gonna be the external. So at that point, I'll, I'll go back to you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to raise this and maybe start a discussion and some ideas. And, and trust me, I don't wanna rehash Monday. It was really the bigger picture of how we get into things like, I understand Spanish mackerel are coming up from the South Atlantic and the Southern states in the mid Atlantic want access to that fishery and they don't have, may not get it because the South controls that. So 
it's becoming more and more prevalent with different species along the East Coast. So we really need to come up with a different approach. So thanks and I'll uh, hand it back to you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, thanks, Jim. We, I, I certainly have been monitoring all of these situations and, and did not wade into the fray from, from a state perspective, but um, Bob and I have talked about this particular issue and shifting stocks and, and the reallocation many times. You know, the strong, as we all know, the strong suit of the Atlantic State Marine Fisheries Commission revolves around state rights. and. In this case, the state rights issues become that almost the problem, right? As we try to hold on to allocation, um, I, I certainly understand it, um, and I don't know how to solve it. And I, I even hate to say this, but I told Bob on more than one occasion that, you know, this is where potentially a con congressional um, congressional the Congress, excuse me, is going to have to potentially wade in to try to create some mechanism by which we make these determinations. And it, frankly, it saddens me to say that, but uh, I've got three hands up. I've got uh, Joe Cimino, Roy Miller, uh, Dennis Abbott, and, and a fourth, Chris Bat Savage. Joe, thank you. Yours. I, thank you. I, I, you know, I think to, I have great concerns with doing this formulaically, I think, I think we have to deal with each species separately. You know, we, we chose to tackle, uh, I think, two of the most difficult species to tackle. Summer flounder, I had the good fortune to work in North Carolina, Virginia, and New Jersey, you know, three of the biggest players. That was always a highly mobile fleet. In recent years, they've been getting good money for that species, um, you know, to say that it needed to disappear because fish are moving. Um, was kind of hard to swallow. With black sea bass, again, it's a high dollar fishery. Um, and, and this argument of climate change for a species that, that exists with a population down to Florida, you know, there's no reason to believe that this, this species is going to get chased out of the mid Atlantic anytime soon. You know, if, if we tackle bluefish first, where, where no, if a state does not have that species in their waters, no, no state fishermen are going to be chasing bluefish or spiny dogfish. You know, I don't think it's the same for every species. I think we tackled two that states had a good reason to fight for more than any others. And I think there are other species like dogfish where infrastructure is, is such an issue. Just giving the states that have the fish quota may not always be the best answer. I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, thanks, Joe. Roy Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just add to what uh, Jim said. Uh, there's a coming storm regarding striped bass commercial allocation. So I think um, Jim's suggestion that we look at this and, and look at it soon is a good suggestion because uh, it's been all of our experience that nothing gets more emotional than striped bass allocation issues. And, uh, so we need to deal with this as quickly as we can. And, Read some sort of resolution on how we're going to proceed. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Roy. Uh, Dennis, yeah. Thank you, Pat. I'd probably been giving this whole issue a, a bit of thought in the background, and following Monday's meeting, I sent Jim Gilmore a sympathy card via an email about you know how I felt that the whole meeting went down. It was disappointing in one of the comments that struck me during that meeting was one of the southern states was talking, mentioned that New York was looking for a handout. I forgot the exact words, but the bottom line is, is as we deal with our allocations, we continually rely on historical length. And I question the accuracy of the data, how even the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission was set up years ago to deal with these situations. It was a much different commission back 20 or 30 years ago. So what we end up with something that in my mind that is a whole lot less than objective. The states consistently cherry pick numbers that continue to, as I'd put it, bring home the bacon. And the decisions are contrary in my mind to the intent of the compact 
of interstate cooperation between the states. It just becomes, and it's always a food fight and everybody, you know, they either get to keep what they have and no one's willing to do what I consider is the right thing. You know, we should at this point be living and deciding in the present with an eye to the future, not always talking about, well, I had this and years ago, so I'm not going to give this up. It's much more dynamic. So, you know, the decisions that we make, I wonder if those decisions would be the same if there were neutral parties making those decisions. I suspect it, the outcomes would be much different. And a good example of, you know, things that we do, we were talking this morning about Menhaden and, you know, the allocation issues that are before us and we're trying to figure out Chesapeake Bay and blah, blah, blah. You know, we made a decision last year where each of the states that didn't catch Menhaden would get, what is it, half a percent. And we end up giving a half a percent. This is just an example, I'm not bitching about it or anything. But we gave a half a percent to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania isn't going to use it. We knew beforehand they weren't going to use it. And they refused to loan it out. At least that, that's my understanding. Refused to loan it out. That is piss poor fisheries management. And as Pat said, something has got to change. We've really got to change the way we do business. It just isn't working and it's getting bad. And I felt really bad Monday when what I figured Jim Gilmore took it in the short. And on the other hand, on Monday, we gave Connecticut, it was so bad with Connecticut that we threw them a bone and gave them some added percentage. Not on on any good basis, but we just picked the number out of the hat and we gave them an added percentage, but we didn't give New York any, anything. And then to Jim's point about the Mid-Atlantic Council, New Hampshire just got on the board. So I didn't, I wasn't aware of a bit of the background of how Mid-Atlantic got there. But we fought over hours and hours about whether we should do the trigger approach or the dare approach. And lurking in the background was the Mid-Atlantic Council. <laughs> and they finally got to make a vote. It was like 13 to 4 or something. We didn't stand a chance of getting our position across of being on the prevailing side with them in the background composed of members all from south of New England. It was, it's just, I don't know how to describe it, but it was just comical. But that's what I want to say. We need to change the way we're doing business. That's mm -hmm. enough. Thanks, Dennis. Um, I've got Chris Pat Savage and then Mike Luisi. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I agree with a lot of what Joe Semino said, but I also agree with Dennis and Jim as far as you know, using this approach long term. I guess I have a little different perspective on, on where we are now with quota reallocation and maybe where we'll end up. And we, we all realize that. At least for the species we were tackling, most of them, those allocations have been in place for a long time, um, you know, measure in decades. And you know, to, to switch over entirely to a, a new method that you know, doesn't look at historical landings is a pretty big abrupt change, especially when you consider the, uh, the infrastructure behind uh, the, these fisheries that or based on these, these allocations that, that frankly should have been revisited earlier, but, but we're, we're dealing with it now. I, I see this more of an iterative approach and, and I think just not getting too much into Monday, you know, no one, no one walked away from, from that meeting Monday happy. Everyone gave up something or did not get what they expect. Um, you know, I think, I think that's pushing things in the right direction. And as we tackle, uh, allocation issues in the future, which should be a lot more often than we did in the past. I don't think we're going to be having these, you know, 10, 20 year allocation regimes like we did. I don't think we have a choice but to move away from, from history. If you see states that aren't utilizing quota, 
uh, more so in the future than they are now, then yeah, I mean, things will get reallocated, whether it's through a formulaic approach or some other approach. I think it's gonna depend on the species, like Joe Semina said. But, uh, but I, I'm, I'm maybe foolishly optimistic that, uh, that, that this process will get better as we address this a little more often and maybe get a little more uh, experience doing it um, as, as we go forward. But anyways, uh, just you know, being from a state that uh, is uh, very much involved with, uh, with reallocation of you know, fish you know, not as accessible to our waters and maybe some fish becoming more accessible to our waters, uh, I just I just wanted to share share my thoughts on this. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Michael Easy. You're on mute, Mike. Tina, you may have to. Oh, there we go. There we go. Thanks, Pat. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm 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 a little bit at a loss for words right now. Um, I understand where Jim's coming from, and 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 thank you for for um, recognizing me, uh, Pat. You know, I'm not on the executive committee, but as a part, as I guess maybe my maybe I'll focus my comments on the on the Mid-Atlantic Council um, as, as chair of the council. And, you know, some of the comments that I've heard just, they frustrate me. Um, nobody walked away Monday happy, but we walked away from the issue and we, we found some resolve to try to you know, mitigate the, the issue um, of access, you know, in Southern New England. So I, I feel like we, we did, we did something to try to help. Um, I don't, there, there were six states that had to give up a lot, a lot. I mean, we had to give up a lot and it's you know we tried to find some resolution um it didn't go our it didn't go the way that our six states um felt it should but you know i feel like we still accomplished something so i you know i wasn't i wasn't expecting to to weigh in you know during this meeting today i just i was listening just for you know information purposes but um, you know, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, uh, New Jersey, we did some, we did some serious, you know, the, the, the decisions that we made on Monday were serious. There are people, there are people in my state that are going to, that are going to have economic and financial difficulties because of what we did so the idea that the idea that we didn't do anything and then it, we have to it it it's just it's so frustrating it, it it's making me crazy right now so pat you know i'm i'm gonna stop there i, I feel like if i I'm, I'm just getting wound up um i feel like we did we did some good um and we tried to help out, you know, the states to the north where there was an expansion, you know, with the stock. So I'm just going to leave it at that and uh, um, stop there. Thanks, Pat. I appreciate the uh, the opportunity to speak. Yeah, no, no problem, Mike. No problem. Um, Tom Foley. Yeah, I'm not going to talk about the battle that went on this, between the states because it's like the battle that goes on between commercial and recreational fishermen over quota changes on, on what goes on. And I've, I have been saying for the last 15 years, since 2007, that we are fighting over the scraps and we're not dealing with the real problem. When we, when the 2007 
Badgers and Stevens Act came in and put a whole bunch of other restrictions on what we do and forced us to do a lot with the councils and everything else decided to do. We wind up going in the opposite direction. I mean, in 2003, we formed committees to look at how we would basically, beyond a certain point, share equally in how the stocks were growing. I mean, we never thought that expansion of black sea bass back in 2003 would go on like this. But we figured if it did, the quota would be much larger and we could basically equally sit, share those increase in quota. The problem we've had for the last 15 years is the quotas have all gone in the opposite direction. We are fishing on less quota on summer flounder than we were fishing all through the early part of the 2000s into the night, and we were still rebuilding the stocks. The black sea bass, we've gone in, in the total opposite direction. We basically, and we know and scum that the 200 times what we're, our targets are. But because of the workings of the system, we have not been able to basically take advantage of the expansion of the stocks. And we're still using the quota as if the stocks haven't increased. And that's the real problem here. And that's what puts us against one another. Because none of us are actually seeing a decrease in certain stocks. We're actually seeing more opportunity to catch them and getting yelled at by especially the recreational sector because their catches, because we now on larger fish like summer flounder back then was 0.9 pounds or 0.1.1 pound. And now we're up to four pounds. So if the quota is less, and we were basically catching fish that are now three times the size of what we were catching back there, like three pound four, three pound six. We are now catching in the recreational community 25% less fish. And there's where the problem goes on. So we're basically, the catch and release mortality has gone up dramatically and we're managing fish and we're not taking advantage of what the, we're seeing with the stocks. And I think that's the problem with all our fishermen, both commercially and recreational, see the stocks greatly increased, and yet we're giving them nothing. When was the last time we had a substantial, I mean, two, three, four million pound increase in a quota? And then, then by the time we were finished with all the uh, precautionary approaches, we wound up with about a, a million pounds. I mean, and that's the real problem here. How do we do with increasing stocks? And I've been yelling about this for the last 15 years, that we basically allow the people, uh, the fishermen, both commercial and recreational, to take advantage. We are here to build sustainable fisheries, not to basically hurt other states. And I think that's what we've been hurting state fishermen, both commercial. Why we're putting commercial fishermen and recreational fishing, fishing industry in jeopardy up and down the coast is because of this. And we have to do a better method. And it's the Middle Atlantic Council's part of it when they put all those precautionary measures back in, in 2007. They have adjusted some of those, but we still haven't been able to reap the benefits because of our, our federal partners. But anyway. I think I've said enough, and I was hurt over Monday. I think we did accomplish. New York did go up to a, a, a good increase to over 9%. If I looked at that table, I'd like a copy of that table that we put up, up there during the presentation that showed the increase that Connecticut and the other states took. Okay. Thanks, thanks Tom. Um, it, I'm going to call on Richie White, um, and, and I'm hoping he may have a suggestion. And I think after that, um, I'm going to wrap it up with a couple comments. So, Richie White. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, new to the uh, Black Sea Bass Board, um, it, it was an eye opener uh, for me. Um, my suggestion is that uh, we go ahead and form uh, an in independent group to look at Black Sea Bass and Manhattan because we're headed for the same problem in Manhattan. You, you got the northern states. I mean, New Hampshire had not long ago at 300 pounds a quota, and we're now catching three, four million pounds uh, a year, and, and, you, and you've seen the numbers on Maine. So clearly, the northern states are going to be looking for additional quota. Okay, where does it come from? Somebody else has to give it up, and that is a problem. <clears throat> so. Uh, my suggestion is we form an independent uh, group and just do a trial. Just don't. It, it, it's just for our own information to see what they would do and how they would do it and their reasoning, how they justify it. And we give them Black Sea Bass and Manhattan and see what they come up with. And maybe that will give us uh, some ideas on tools that we could uh, put into place. Thank you. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, um, Richie. And Jim, I'll come to you in a minute. I, 
I, I think we need to, quite honestly, I think we need to step back. This just happened Monday. I think we need to kind of step back, be thinking about what happened. I mean, I think Chris Bat Savage said it, you know, it, kind of everybody's upset. So maybe that's, maybe the right thing did happen. Um, we all know that allocation is a four letter word um, when it comes to fisheries management issues. And um, we now are trying to do that in the face of climate change. We started having some conversations with leadership of um, the, the New England, the MID and, and ASMSC about how we're going to tackle that. They never really go anywhere. Um, we had those conversations I, back when Jim Gil, first year, I think Jim Gilmore was the chair. Um, it's very, they're very difficult. We all, we all recognize that, um, but we do need to try to figure out how we're going to, I'll circle back to what Jim actually said at the very beginning. It's really not about back sea bass. It's about how, how are we going to have a process that looks um, forward? Um, Dennis mentioned that as well. Joe Semino mentioned that as well. How are we going to look forward and not back? Um, I'll take a couple more quick comments on this and then we've got to wrap it up. Um, Jim, Jim Gilmore and then Sheree Patterson. Yeah, thanks, Pat. Just quickly, and, and, and that's actually helpful. I mean, like I said, some of the briefings I'm going to do is that we're going to, uh, I think that's a good idea. We all need to like take a breather and then figure out where we're going before anybody starts taking, you know, any kind of action. So, and I would be very, uh, very much willing to volunteer to help out on that approach. The only thing I wanted to uh, mention to Dennis Abbott, what he brought up, um, Pennsylvania did transfer some Menhaden to New York. So um, just wanted to give you the most recent data and thanks to Pennsylvania for doing that this year. Great, thanks. Um, Shereen, did you have a comment? Yes, real quickly. Um, would this be something that an MSE can also tackle as they deal with specific uh, species in our future? I wish we were on camera because you would have seen my face scrunch up like that emoji, trying to even think about that, uh, how we would do that with MSC. Uh, I don't know if Jason McNamee might have thoughts around that. Pat, Jay had to leave for uh, the rest of the meeting, so he's not here. All right. Um, let's, put a, let's put a hold on that question, Shri, and come back to it. I think, you know, we're talking about multiple species here with, with Richie's suggestion. Um, that's certainly will roll into a policy, have to roll into a policy board discussion. But I think at the very least, we need to, we, we need to, as I said, let's take a step back. Let's, um, let's maybe have a few conversations at a couple of our next executive committee calls, um, and make a determination on how we want to bring, um, an idea back to the board. Um, uh, to the policy board. John here has his hand up. John, I would, I would want to recognize you. I'm not sure your mic has been turned off or on, I should say. It's on, John. Okay. Great. Go, John. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pat, for recognizing me. You know, just the one piece to add to this is that the, there is going to be a scenario planning effort ongoing along the East Coast. Um, it's being sort of led by the Mid-Atlantic Council, but ASMFC, New England Council, uh, Northeast Center, uh, GARFO are all involved. Um, and you know, I'm not sure that's just very preliminary effort, but you know, I would assume that one of the attributes of fisheries that that scenario planning activity is going to look at is shifting stocks and consequences to management. So I just wanted to raise that as as a potential venue to sort of start exploring some of these issues, but not in a sort of full scale MSE. So thank you for the time to just discuss that. Uh, that that's actually a really good reminder, John. I had forgotten about those conversations um, around scenario planning. Um, if we were on camera, you really would have seen my face scrunch up a little bit then. Um, but um, Mike Lisi, I saw your hand go up and back down. I'll give you just one quick last word here. Yeah, thanks, Pat. No, John, John covered it. I just, I just wanted to make sure that the uh, executive committee was familiar. Uh, they were um, updated on work that's going to be done by the council um, regarding this kind of thing. And I, I, I think that, yeah, we can all, you know, maybe, maybe we should have a discussion about 
um, membership on maybe a, a work group or, you know, I don't, I don't know where it's going to go, but, you know, just keep it in mind. Thanks. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, John, John covered it for me. Great. Great. Yeah. And I appreciate that. So with that reminder as well from John, um, I think, you know, there are, there are some pieces to the puzzle that are trying to be put together. Um, we pro I think we've had a scenario planning, Bob, I'm looking to you now. We, have we done a scenario planning update with the policy board yet? I'm having trouble thinking that far back. Uh, no, we have not. We, we probably need to do that. Um, frankly, Laura and I are working on the contract uh, to move that money around. Um, we haven't made much progress on it recently, but uh, I think yeah. you're right. A scenario planning update to policy board would be a, a great step. Just so folks know what the anticipated output from that that effort will be, it's going to be, I don't know, probably a two-year process to um, you know work all work through that. There's going to be public and stakeholder and, and commissioner involvement, and council member involvement up and down the east coast. It's all three councils and the commission, so it's a it's a fairly big undertaking, and I think it you know hopefully it'll produce some results that'll help us out of the box we're in and. and you know, while I'm speaking, Mr. Chairman, I know you're trying to wrap this up. You know, it, it, it this is a tough issue, obviously, or we wouldn't be talking about it. And it's it's not just state by state commercial shares. You know, it's we're going to have the same difficult conversation when we talk about recreational commercial split uh, for summer fun. It's got black sea bass and bluefish, and, and you know, it, it's just anytime one state sector group deer type, whatever it is, has something and conditions change and and but history doesn't um you know what what are the criteria that that makes sense to move something from column a to column b and i'm not proposing what direction or what the columns are but it's just um you know winners and losers are really really hard for the commission to deal with and any any entity to deal with and you know gordon colvin i think 25 years ago kind of one of the primary authors of the atlantic coastal act he you know his quote to me was you know state by state shares are going to tear this commission apart and you know that's that's what we're guarding against right now is gordon's prophetic comments from you know a couple decades ago so it's not hard i mean it's not not an easy subject and we're gonna have to sort of chip away at it uh slowly but surely and figure out what what the states are comfortable with because it's no matter how we cut it, it, it's really difficult for a state to come into a meeting room, even if that state believes that, that they can give something up, or that sector believes they can give something up, or that gear type believes they can give something up. It's hard for that person to come in, raise their hand, and say, yep, I'm in favor of having less of A. Um, and and that's, you know, that's the way the commission's set up. So how do we, you know, how do we Deal with that reality as well? And uh, I'm not saying take the authority out of the commissioner's hands by any means, but it's just a you know, 45 commissioners are all 45 political animals. So, um, you know, it, it's a uh, something we need to keep working on, I think. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, with that, I think we need to wrap this discussion up. This is a, this is a tough one. It's going to take some time and attention and, and understanding. We're all going to have to be listening closely to the other the concerns of other states, um, understanding what those concerns are and then figuring out, okay, is there a process we can uh, use to move forward, and and maybe scenario planning will be a will be a benefit. I'll 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 try to remain optimistic about that. And John, no no reason to answer this question now, but hopefully you and your staff can be available to help with the presentations that I've seen in the past from your shop uh, on scenario planning. Um, so with that, is there any other business to be brought before the executive committee? Hearing none. Um, Bob, do you have any announcements for upcoming meetings before we adjourn? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman. I think um, what is it? Uh, Coastal Sharks is next, and we'll start that at ten fifteen. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we will mm -hmm. we will adjourn, um, and uh, and we will start our regular biweekly calls um, I, either the next week or the week after. But you should have it on your schedule. So. Thank you very much um, for your time today. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, James Fletcher from the public had his hand raised. Um, James, is, um, do you have a quick comment for the board?
James, you're muted. Okay. The problem is that you are not looking at why we are importing 92 to 93 percent of the seafood consumed in this country. Yeah. And it all comes back to mismanagement. It comes back and to I, mismanagement. I, and I look forward to. Yeah. And uh, we, I, need, we need to look at what needs to be done. We waste more than 50 percent of what is harvested due to discard regulations or due to permits in certain states. You've got to go back and think seriously about what the United National Fishermen has opposed is to go to a dollar value per boat per foot and no discarding. On the recreational side, total utilization, no discarding. And then look at enhancing the stocks through artificial means, which raise mostly female fish for release. But what we're James, doing James, that, James, I'm gonna, James, I'm gonna jump in and interrupt you. I appreciate those comments. We're we're gonna adjourn for the day. You'll have many, many more opportunities in order to be able to uh to uh give the executive committee and the boards um that type of information in the future but i appreciate your time appreciate everybody's time here this morning um we'll conclude this meeting and we will uh, uh reconvene uh in a few weeks for our uh bi-weekly meetings so thank you very much everybody i appreciate it um tough conversation uh around those allocation conversations but we'll find a way to work through it so thank you very much and you guys have a great day and successful meetings today